I did not know until just <laughs> we were at the Ann Springs yes. Gateway. Uh -huh. We have every year the family pictures. I can get my chair sitting on the ground. I know mine's always low when I mm -hmm. come in. Well, they may put them back down. I think that's what happens to me. That's for me. Yep. Yep. We used to come now, to Anthony, Anthony let's see. Who here is on this Across the river, the river from me. Yeah. We, we, who is on this Anytime we go visit her, that would be part of what we would do, is go to the outlet. Yes, okay. yes, yes. He uh, lots of sheep. He's an outlet. So, Bronson, yeah, that's a wonderful place. Yeah. not. I'm not. No, Bronson is. You are. She is. Okay. Primager's Right now, we only got to settle down. Awful. I know I can play the chair game. <laughs> I like the it seems like we've shifted a little bit. Right? Right. <laughs> oh, my. oh, make sure I got all my sounds off. <laughs> I did. Yeah, okay. I would like to call to order the Policy and Legislative Committee meeting of the State Board of Education for Tuesday, November 14th, 2023. Welcome to those of you in attendance and we appreciate your interest in public education. I would like to recognize the following visitors who are here with us today. Um, Tracy Williams from Teach Right USA. Um, Kathy Maness from Palmetto State Teachers Association. Hey, Kathy. Um, Debbie Elmore from the South Carolina School Boards Association. Thank you for being here today. I would also like to recognize news media present. We have Henry Shoster from CBS News and Mary Green from WIS. If there is any other news media present that I didn't name, please recognize yourself at this time. Okay, thank you. Committee members, you have before you the minutes from the October 10th, 2023 Policy and Legislative Committee meeting. Is there any objection to approve the meeting, um, the minutes as they are presented to you? No objection. Right. Hearing none, the minutes are approved by unanimous consent. I did want to say, I know that we have several visitors to our committee meeting this morning, and so I do want to acknowledge who the actual committee members are, and of course, we welcome any of our state board members um, to be at the table and be a part of those committee meetings, but our voting members for policy and legislative um, are Mr. Alan Walters and then Ms. Delaney Frierson. Ms. Sally Lee could not be here today. Um, she is not able to join us, and Dr. O'Shields will hopefully be joining us soon, and we'll continue on. You also have before you the agenda for today's committee meeting. Is there any objection to approving the agenda as it's been presented to you? No objection. Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. We do have several people signed up for public comment this morning. Um, I did want to ask our committee members, because we have more signed up than when allow for our normal practice of six people to speak for five minutes within our 30 minute allotment, if you would be okay um, about approving a modification to that so that we allow three minutes to allow more people to be able to speak this morning. Yes, ma'am. Great. Any objections to that? Okay, great. Then we will do that. 
We appreciate everyone's interest in being here, and we will call people up for the public comment section. When we do, you will be allotted three minutes for your comments. As you know, we will be hearing your comments for the first time, um, so we will accept those as information, and if we need any additional information, we would contact you later on. So we appreciate you in advance understanding our procedures. All right. Then I would like to go ahead and call up. Um, I did have one more request. I'm sorry. We know there are several people that will be speaking for or against this possible proposed regulation. Um, so we do ask if you're speaking this morning, it's just a request. If you're speaking this morning, if we could give someone else an opportunity at the full board meeting at one o'clock. Um, but that's just a request from our committee members just asking so that more people have an opportunity. All right, then we will begin um, with Steve Newsom. Thank you for being here today, and um, and that will be three minutes. We'll go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I I'll have to speak a little faster than I thought. I was um, a classroom English teacher for 16 years, so literacy instruction is a really important issue for me. Um, and I have a lot of concerns about the regulations, but I'm gonna focus on literacy instruction specifically. We know many states have already passed similar restrictive policies on instructional materials, and, and many districts in our state have too. And the only good thing about that is that we don't have to guess what the effects of the proposed regulations might be. By broadly banning what are called obscenity and sexual content in the proposed regs, we're inviting challenges and or bans of many texts that we can anticipate from the previous challenges, which would be books featuring representations of people of color and LGBTQ plus people, and many more that will probably give even proponents of restrictions a surprise based on the way it's written, because the terms are defined in a way that prohibits even older students from accessing any text at school, whether for a class assignment or for self-selected reading that contains any word that could not be aired on broadcast television and any description that contains uh, sexual content as defined in the regs. So while I understand the impulse to protect children and, and selecting appropriate text was a huge part of my job, I think it's a problem to try to do this at a statewide level with such broad regulations. I just wanted to share a couple examples of what we've seen happen in other areas and in our own state. In Utah, the Bible was removed from schools at the end of last, last school year for vulgarity or violence, so a similar standard as what the regs uh, create. Obviously, the Bible does contain some pretty graphic descriptions of nudity, sex, incest, sexual assault, murder, and other forms of violence, but it's the context of the content that determines whether the text should be considered obscene or pornographic, and few would argue that the Bible is, but the regulations as written don't allow us to consider context. Similarly, in Florida, Texas, and other states, a graphic novel version of Anne Frank was um, challenged or removed, again, on the grounds of sexual content. And I think if you look at the actual text, the context makes that content make sense. In many states, To Kill a Mockingbird has been banned. Same idea. Um, I think we're going to run into a really serious problem with these regs with most books that deal with the history of racism because, for example, we can't say the N-word on broadcast television or the radio, but a lot of those books are going to contain that word but in context, it's there for a reason. Um, in South Carolina, most book challenges have focused on out of context words or depictions. Pickens County restricted Dear Martin, a book that explores the complexities of a young black man's life after he is wrongly arrested because it contains bad language, including the N word. But Mr. again, Newsman, I'm so I'm sorry. sorry. We are at the end of the three minutes. Got you. But would you like to wrap up with one sentence? Sure. I just, that my, my main concern is that by, um, having this very broad standard, I understand it was supposed to create clarity, but we're going to end up banning a lot of texts that we probably didn't intend to ban. And so giving that ability to the people who are experts, which would be teachers and librarians, supporting them would be a better use of, I think, our time. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Next, we have Ms. Whitney Hendricks. 
Thank you for being here today, Ms. Hendricks. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to cut my comments down very briefly um, to, to accommodate the three minutes. My name is Whitney Hendricks. I'm a mom of three right here in the Midlands. I'm a product of our South Carolina public schools, and I've been an outspoken advocate for traditional public school um, all along. Um, my children have been, uh, we, we relocated to a public charter this year, and I thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, many have tried to conflate the issue of uh, propose, this proposed regulation with conservative fundamentalism and religion. However, the majority of the books that have been challenged over the past year, two years, violate long-held societal standards of propriety and decency, regardless of political position or religious outlook. Buzzwords like book banning and censorship are tragically pitting concerned parents and citizens against educators. Simply put, public education is in a state of crisis, and this is nothing new. And we need the state to step in to provide much needed guidance on these issues to begin rebuilding trust in this vital function of our society. The reality is challenges to materials consume time and resources that schools could better spend in ways that tangibly benefit students. By standardizing the selection and appeals process, you are removing a heavy burden at the local level. Most importantly, however, you are realigning valuable South Carolina resources to support educational goals. Given the academic challenges we continue to face, we must make certain that every available resource is consistent with our mission. This is a long overdue path forward. Please vote in support of this regulation today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hendricks, for being here today. Next, we have Jamie Gregory. Hello, Ms. Gregory. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jamie Gregory, and I have been an educator in South Carolina for 19 years. My children spent a total of 19 years in the public education system in South Carolina. Based on my lived experiences as in education as both a parent and as an educator, I respectfully request that you hear the very real concerns brought to you today about this proposal. When using terms like obscenity and sexually explicit materials, I think it would be helpful if we all remember that we have a shared concern. All of us involved in education want our children to succeed and to have the best chance at achieving a world-class education. School librarians have undertaken the most sacred job of helping teach children to love to read. But we find ourselves here today discussing the idea that the State Board of Education needs to take control over every local school district's ability to select instructional materials because educators keep allowing inappropriate and harmful materials into schools. The proposal claims that people, I'm sorry, I just lost my place. <laughs> no, you are fine. <laughs> uh, using my phone. Okay. The proposal claims that people all over our state are grappling with questions and concerns about age-appropriate materials. This claim is not made in good faith. If you look at the data compiled by districts and state organizations, few people are registering formal challenges to school library books. In fact, sometimes just one person formally challenges dozens of books at a time, as we saw happen in Beaufort County. If you follow current events, though, you already know that almost all of the 97 books challenged in Beaufort County have been returned to schools based on the decisions of local book review committees. This means that the local community has taken the concerns of an individual seriously, reviewed the materials by spending its own time and money, and decided collectively that they are indeed appropriate. This decision does not mean a parent's concerns were not heard. That parent can still ensure his or her children do not check out the books in question. This proposal seeks to negate this community decision-making process by establishing a state-level appeal process, which would make it possible for that one person to ban a book or 97 books from every single public school in the state of South Carolina. And that person would not even be required to have a child in the local school system in order to file a complaint. If that weren't disturbing enough, the language used to establish a need for such control is vague and broad enough to cause widespread confusion and fear when the proposal actually purports to provide clarity. Many beloved classics by Shakespeare and Harper Lee and Mark Twain would not make the cut under the obscenity and sexually explicit guidelines presented. 
Furthermore, educators should not live in fear that they might be summoned to the State Board of Education if found to be in violation, facing whatever the board deems appropriate, as is the exact wording in this proposal. Whatever the board deems appropriate, with no further clarification provided, which That's reminds great, great. me of the importance of the 14th Amendment, articulating the rights of all Americans to the due process of law. Ms. Gregory, I am so sorry. Time is up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you thank for you. being here. Next, we have um, Megan Baumgartner. Good morning, Madam Chair, morning. committee members. My name is Megan Baumgartner. My family and I live in West Columbia and within Lexington County School District too. I became aware of a multitude of sexually explicit and other extremely questionable instructional materials found within our district earlier this year. As a concerned citizen with school-aged children, I have paid close attention to how concerns related to these questionable materials have been addressed. I would like to share those with you today. First and foremost, I am alarmed at how biased the various school and district level review committees have been. The school level committee makeup per our policy is to consist of one teacher, one administrator, the librarian, and one parent. One high school in our district decided to conflate their numbers by using a teacher who was also a parent to count as the parent rep on their committee. Additionally, parents on school level committees have expressed concern about the unfair committee makeup. One parent even stated it was made clear to her that because she was not an educator and had a different perspective, that she was an outsider. We hear year after year that teachers wish parents would be more involved. These situations beg the question as to whether or not that truly is the case. I personally attended some of the district level book review committees as these were open to the public. Per policy, district level review committees are to be composed of eight people. Most notably of the eight committee members, just one is to be a parent. All the other members are employed by the district, one of which is the librarian. There was little if any consistency in the makeup of the district level review committees. Some had five members, another seven, another eight, and another one had no parent representative at all. This is in direct contradiction of the policy. Additionally, in most cases, the librarian that selected the submitted purchase order for the material in question served on the committee evaluating the material's value. This is a blatant conflict of interest. When members of the public relate our concerns regarding these inconsistencies, disregard for policy and conflict of interest, the district just moved forward with the process. When materials went to the board level to be appealed, a board member stated, and I quote, we have to trust committees to make the right recommendation on these books, end quote. The process by which these review committees made their recommendations was flawed, and the superintendent and board did nothing about it. As a parent, this spoke volumes to me and reinforced my concerns. Through my close observations and unfortunately my great disappointment, I have witnessed how broken our district's policy and process is for public concerns and complaints about instructional materials. As a result, I am here today to offer my emphatic support for Regulation 43170. The inconsistencies in the application of current policy, disregard to policy altogether, and lack of articulated standards, other than what can only be perceived as personal opinion, provide ample justification for why Regulation 47170 47170 is needed. Statewide standards that hold every school district in the state accountable for the content of the instructional material provided to our children on the front end will go a long way in parents being able to rely on school libraries and, class li and classrooms as a trusted source of instructional material rather than one of controversy. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, my, my sound went off, but I was gonna say time is up. Thank you for being here today. Next, um, we have Josh Malkin. I said that right. Please correct me if I said that incorrectly. Good morning. My name is Josh Malkin. I'm the senior advocacy strategist for the ACLU of South Carolina. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee this morning. I spend a sad amount of my life addressing book bans and have an acute sense of how they are playing out across the state. Frequently, one or two people target an enormous list of books. In Beaufort, it was 97 titles, in Berkeley, 93, in Ori, over 70. Let's be clear, these individuals always have multiple opportunities to opt their student out of any title that they would like. The belief that one person's perception should dictate what books are available to 45,000 students is dangerous in a democracy. Often these complaints do not follow the district's policy. They skip the requisite conversation with educators or administrators. They first bring their concerns to the school board, or in some instances, local law enforcement. 
At school board meetings, they threatened school board members with arrest and called them slanderous names. The result of the challenges then depends largely on the makeup of the school board. A student's access to books is based on their geography. Therefore, I do see value in a statewide policy that strengthens protections for academic freedom. I'd like to highlight some components of model policies that would help school boards get back to the business of improving student outcomes and managing school districts. First, books that are challenged should remain on shelves while under review. In Buford, those 97 titles have been effectively off shelves for the year it's taken to facilitate all the review committees. Next, only parents, students, and educators at a school should be able to challenge a title at that school. Next, a challenge that does not follow the enumerated procedure should not proceed. A parent should only be able to challenge one book at a time. Our friends in Florida have made it far too easy to mass produce book challenges without reading the actual book. Lastly, review committees should continue to be comprised of educators and parents of students in the school. But I believe students should also serve on review committees in high school. The book banning movement supposes that our older students are empty vessels who should not have any say in protecting their rights. As a former high school teacher, I can tell you that our students are incredibly up for the task and would certainly be honest about their impressions of a book. It would also give them a taste of civic engagement. Book challenges in South Carolina have increased by nearly 4,000% between 2021 and 2022. Book banners are turning school board meetings into <coughs> circuses across the state. A strong statewide policy could help everyone get back to the business of providing the best educational environments we can. Sadly, the drafted policy will lead to uncertainty and thousands of books being taken off of shelves immediately. It will also lead you all of having to entertain the same nonsense that local boards currently endure. If someone does not like the decision from their local board, they will very likely appeal to you, creating a time cost that will impede this board's ability to do its job, improve educational outcomes for all South Carolina's children. To summarize, I think a strong statewide policy could help return attention to where it should be, our students. I hope this committee and the larger board will work to amend this policy so that it is far more protective of our students' right to read. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. You were like right on three minutes. Goodness. I was, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Mr. Malcolm. Next, we would um, ask Melanie Shaw. Good morning. Uh, my name is Melanie Shaw. I'm an alumni of the University of South Carolina a former educator in Lexington District 2, a wife, a mom, a mother-in-law, and an administrator for Pace for Lex 2. I'm an author and the publisher of Living Real Magazine. For the past nine months, concerned parents, grandparents, and community members have submitted book complaint forms using the citizens' request for review of education materials. Between the end of March and May, PACE members submitted 30 book complaints, one at a time. Many of our book con books contain sexually explicit and what would be considered illegal pornographic material. Since our submissions, we've learned that Scazzle wrote the state's model policy under the direction of the previous South Carolina Department of Education superintendent. The former chief officer was also asked by the governor to audit our school libraries a couple of years ago, and this never happened. This is why we're here today. Pace for Lex 2 followed our district's book complaint policy to the T. We've exposed and documented how biased and absurd the policy is. The questions asked of the book review committees were strategically designed to ignore the actual content of the books and um, were referred to use biased resources to affirm the books in question. When you have librarians filling out the purchase orders for the books, their principals blindly signing off of the purchase orders, the district personnel blindly signing off, no one is vetting the purchases. This is a major flag, red flag. Then if there's a complaint form filled out, the complainant is required to deliver one copy to each school principal where the book was found and also a copy to the superintendent. In our case, not one principal had a book review committee in place at the beginning of the school year per board policy. Therefore, they were scrounging to find people to serve on the district committees. We even had some principals who never responded to our complaints through the policy, though the policy required them to do so. The school and district reviews were open to the public until the district changed the rules and the school committees midstream without giving notice to the complainants. I showed up to listen to a school level discussion, which I was invited to, but when I arrived, I was uninvited by the librarian, stating the district superintendent told her the complainants were not allowed anymore. Rules were changed, ignored, and even made up as we plowed through the process. 
While a few books were pulled from the, before the process began, most of the books were voted to be retained by our school committees. The citizens' review policy and process is biased, cumbersome, and blatantly unfair to parents. It is clearly designed to discourage and intimidate complainants from engaging. Most parents decline to enter the review process once they discover how confusing, dysfunctional, time-consuming, and intimidating it actually is. Of course, this is all by design in order to perpetuate an agenda of groups like ALA and SCASL. Librarians wrote the review policy. Librarians select materials Michelle, placed in the schools. I'm so sorry, time that's, is up. Do you wanna finish that sentence? Uh, that's okay, to just uh -huh. let you know that it's biased. Mm -hmm. I also would um, submit an amendment. Uh, we have people complaining that the books might be dismissed if they are like old, but why don't we just go from 2000 and up? they mm -hmm. recent published books that are causing the problem. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Next, we have Carly Carter. Good morning. My name is Carly Carter and I'm the chapter chair of Moms for Liberty in Anderson County. I'm here today to explain my experience and why I'm in support of Superintendent Weaver's proposed regulation for the selection of school materials. When I started the chapter in Anderson about a year ago, book challenges were not my first priority. I saw what was happening around the state and country and I truly believe that no one in our county would advocate for exposing minors to sexually explicit material, especially while they're at school. To me, the statement that minors should not see, hear, or read graphic sexual content, especially without the knowledge and consent of their parents, is not partisan or controversial. But just a few months into starting my chapter, my eyes were opened to the fact that there are, in fact, people in groups, not only in South Carolina, but in Anderson County, who are openly and aggressively advocating for children to have access to these materials while at school. In Anderson County, we have five school districts, so my group has had the unique opportunity to see firsthand how situations and challenges are handled so inconsistently across districts, even within the same county. Some of the districts have immediately removed the lewd material as soon as it's brought to their attention, while others continue to deny that words can even be pornographic without images. These discrepancies make book challenges time-consuming, uncomfortable, and often futile for parents. The results of book challenges are currently based on the opinions of a group of librarians, administrators, board members, and teachers rather than objective standards. We desperately need Superintendent Weaver's regulation in order to clearly define what is age appropriate so that the local boards can have transparent conversations around the materials. Some will argue that this proposed regulation is an attack on certain groups of people based on sexual orientation, gender, identity, race, et cetera, rather than the exposure of minors to pornography as defined by South Carolina law. This is where we have to stay focused on the conversation at hand. The purpose of this regulation is to, the, to determine the appropriateness of the actions described in the material rather than a discussion of the characters of people performing the actions. And if the actions of the characters in these books can't be discussed in a staff room at work amongst adults, then why do we want to fill our children's minds with it? Once a child is exposed to this material, you can't give them their innocence back. Parents know their children best and know when their child is physically, mentally, and emotionally ready for these mature topics. It's not the right of anyone else to take a child's innocence and still a parent's right to be the ones to have these conversations with their children. While challenging these books with pornographic content, our opposition has presented a recurrent theme of literary freedom. During the month of October, the ALA promotes a banned book week, also known as Freedom to Read. I believe that this is a misrepresentation of the word freedom in regards to minors. It is our job as parents, teachers, and adults to teach children that freedom is not the rejection of restraints, but learning to embrace the right restraints. With clear, transparent guidelines to provide age-appropriate material in libraries, the school library does become a safe haven where ch Ms. children can freely roam and select books. Ms. Carter, I'm sorry, time is up. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for you being so much. here today. Next, we have Katie Leventis. Good morning, my name is Katie Leventis and I'm a parent in Anderson District 1. Our story and district are not unique. Versions of this are happening throughout the state. But um, I come to the board today on behalf of concerned parents, teachers, and students, and we urge you to take a stand and pass this policy that holds our South Carolina educational material to a higher standard. 
The library should house many different viewpoints, but the material uncovered in our schools was obscene, sexually explicit material that offers no educational value to minors. I never imagined the vulgar things I read could actually be here in South Carolina schools. On May 2nd, nine books were brought to the attention of Anderson District 1. When I asked to speak before the re review committees in person on a few books, I was instead sent a Zoom link for two district committees, one for the school level committee and one for the district level. Both meetings were conducted with a administrator showing themselves on the Zoom link, but all the other screens were blacked out. It said high school teacher one, middle school teacher one, so on and so forth. It was the most untransparent thing ever. Nobody spoke. It was just like I was talking to myself. Um, and when I asked who the committee members were, I was told I was un, um, for their safety and privacy, I could not be told who these committee members were, even though they knew exactly who I was. Ironically, shortly after these meetings, I received a threatening package to my home just for questioning this content. It took over 115 days for a decision to be made on these books. Our superintendent said the people that want this vulgar material given to minors are threatening to sue the district, wasting valuable educational funds if these books were removed. I do applaud some of our local administrators who went in and cleaned house on the back end, though. They took out countless books that they saw as examples of pornographic material given to minors. Board members have said they do not want this in our district, but their hands are tied, so a policy and guidelines that clearly define what sexual conduct is would be very beneficial. This new policy would save time instead of playing whack-a-mole with the porn books across districts, because for every one that's removed, five more seem to be added. If there's educational value in these books, find another one that teaches the same thing without the porn. If you can't, then there's no question this material is meant to indoctrinate, sexualize, and confuse our precious children. Another example of why we need a clear policy for these books is because when two other sexually explicit books were questioned, there were 10 plus copies of each of them. I was told by the superintendent those books are a part of the adult bookshelf in the library back room, and it's only available to adults in the building, which still makes this taxpayer funded porn. We were told these books since were removed and the school was reimbursed for the cost. Our education system should not be used as a vessel to push perverse ideologies and sexualize the children at the taxpayer's expense. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Laventis, for being here. That is the last of um, individuals signed up for public comment this morning. Again, we do appreciate each of you being here today um, and sharing with us during that public comment time. At this time, um, we will be looking at the first reading of proposed State Board of Education Regulation 43170 Uniform Procedure for Selection or Reconsideration of Instructional Materials. And I would like to ask Mr. John Tyler, um, Deputy Superintendent and General Counsel from the Division of Legal Affairs to please begin that presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, esteemed members of the South Carolina State Board of Education. It's a privilege this morning to uh, present to you requesting approval on behalf of the South Carolina Department of Education, Regulation 43-170, the Uniform Procedure for Selection or Reconsideration of Instructional Materials. I'm before you briefly this morning to introduce the law and then introduce the presenter who will go over the nuts and bolts of the regulation as well as answer your questions. This law is, this regulation is coming under South Carolina Code uh, section 59-5-60, uh, sub items one and seven, which is the general powers of the State Board of Education. And the State Board of Education has the authority, the power to adopt policies, rules, and regulations not inconsistent with the laws of the state for its own government and for the government of the free public schools. And number seven, the State Board of Education has the power to prescribe and enforce the use of textbooks and other instructional materials for the various subjects taught or used in conjunction within the free public schools of the state. Additionally, we have uh, section 60-9-30, uh, which is 
uh, addresses the, while it's not Title 59, it's Title 60, it addresses the duties of the State Board of Education. And the State Board of Education shall select and publish a list of library books and also a list of supplementary readers and shall make all necessary rules and regulations concerning the use and care of libraries. That is a brief introduction to the law under which this regulation is presented. And now Mr. Coleman, uh, Miles Coleman, attorney at Nelson Mullins, will come and present to you the nuts and bolts of the regulation as presented. Thank you for being here, Mr. Coleman. Good morning. Thank you very much. If you are a constitutional law nerd, as I am, you can imagine nothing more enjoyable than getting to talk to people about the Constitution, who are interested in listening. So it's my pleasure to be here this morning. The proposed regulation before you today is the product of a careful and deliberate process <clears throat> to craft a document and a process that's pedagogically sound, medically and scientifically appropriate, logistically feasible, and legally defensible. The document before you is the product of scores of conversations, perhaps hundreds of them, and discussions between the department's leadership and educators across the state, administrators across the state, librarians, parents, and subject matter experts. This document's a product of many, many hours of careful, thoughtful, deliberate conversation, thought, review and revision to produce a product that is pedagogically appropriate, medically and scientifically sound, logistically feasible, and legally defensible. We have quite a bit to cover for you uh, together this morning. Let me kind of give you a little bit of a roadmap of what I'd like to talk about, and then we'll get down to it. First, I'm going to start with, if you'll forgive me, a little bit about me. If you're going to listen to me and if my words are to have any weight to you, you need to know who it is that's talking to you. So I'll talk about myself just a little bit to give a bit of perspective there. We'll talk some about why this regulation is needed, and we've heard a little bit about that already this morning. We'll talk about what is contained in the proposed regulation, and then we'll talk about the fact that it's legally defensible. At the end, I'd be happy to entertain questions that uh, the distinguished members may have. And along the way, I may try to respond to a few of the points that you've already heard in the public comment this morning. First, and again, I'm sorry if it feels a bit self-aggrandizing, but I do think it is appropriate and helpful, a little bit about me. I'm a partner at Nelson Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough. I'm in our Greenville office. We're one of the largest law firms in the country with nearly 1,000 lawyers. And a significant portion of my practice is devoted to First Amendment law and constitutional issues. In that capacity, I've represented multiple governors, current and former, of this state. I've represented multiple state agencies. I've both sued state agencies for constitutional violations, and I've defended state agencies against alleged constitutional violations. <coughs> I've represented the Department of Education before. I've represented public and private universities in the state and outside of the state in constitutional and First Amendment matters. I've represented public school districts within the state. In the course of my practice, I've co-authored work with and on behalf of a number of the leading constitutional professors and First Amendment scholars across the country. And earlier this year, my First Amendment work has been cited twice by the majority opinion of the US Supreme Court in a recent Supreme Court decision. Again, all that to say, I've had the fortunate opportunity and privilege in the course of my career to receive special training, experience, and practice in this area. And I believe what I have to say to you this morning comes in light of that, in light of that subject matter expertise. And I hope it's helpful to you. Enough about me. Let's talk about the regulation. First, why is it needed? We've already heard a little bit about that this morning. Questions about the appropriateness and educational suitability of instructional materials are becoming an increasingly frequent topic of conversation and debate, both in South Carolina and across the country. We've heard examples this morning already of how those issues have been coming up 
Unfortunately, at present, there is no clear, consistent, uniform, transparent process, standard, or definitions. We've heard a little bit about that. In some districts, the process works some way. In other districts, it works another way. In some, the process moves more quickly. In some, the process moves more slowly. In some, there's transparency. You know who's on that review committee. You know who the complainant was. You know the results and the reasoning of the decision. But in others, you don't know any of those things. In some districts, as we've already heard, certain materials might be found appropriate, while in neighboring districts, they might not be. What you end up with is a patchwork quilt of processes and results. This regulation sets out to bring uniformity, clarity, and consistency to that process. And to be clear, while we believe, and I think all of the commenters you've already heard from this morning would agree, that the vast majority of our public school teachers, administrators, librarians, and other public school employees have the best interests of our children at heart, are committed to the educational mission, are using common sense and acting in good faith, one result of this patchwork process is that when issues like this do come up, they're becoming increasingly, increasingly becoming a distraction and a diversion from allowing those people to do the job that they've been hired to do, educating. Every school board meeting that uses up an hour or two talking about this and debating what the process should be or debating what the standards should be is time that could be better spent educating and uh, taking care of real world challenges in our school districts. We hope to bring some clarity and consistency to that process. We've heard already this morning that teachers are, and administrators and librarians are, are allegedly living in fear of, of what might happen. Where's the fear coming from? In large part, I would submit to you it's fear of the unknown, that we don't know what the standards are. We don't know what the process is. It varies from place to place. We don't know what the appeals process is. To the extent that we can unify, clarify, and make transparent that process, I think it will resolve, in large part, many of the concerns that we've heard. So that's the why. Why do we have this regulation before us today? Now the what. This could be perhaps one of the longest segments. We don't have enough time, even as it is, to go into excruciating detail of this regulation. <coughs> I do want to walk through it, however, section by section, and discuss at what I hope is a sufficient degree of detail, not to bore you, but to allow you to subsequently articulate questions based on it. I think all of you should have before you the same copy of the proposed regulation that I have. We'll move to page, bottom of page two, I believe is where the text of the regulation starts. You'll see section one, definitions. It's very briefly at the bottom of page two, spills over onto page three. Subsection A defines instructional materials, which are the subject of this regulation. Subsection B defines instructional programs. Subsection C defines age and developmentally appropriate. And I'll stop there just to drill down a bit more deeply on subsection C. I suspect that may be where you have some questions later on. And it's also a subject on which we've already heard public comment this morning. I won't read it aloud to you. I'm sure you've read it already and you can read it again but I'll highlight a couple of the components here of age and developmentally appropriate. That's the term being defined here. It refers to their cognitive, emotional, and behavioral capacity of students. And it refers to the fact that materials are not age and developmentally appropriate if they include descriptions or depictions of sexual conduct as that term is already defined by South Carolina law goes on to say it doesn't include materials that would be considered obscene or indecent as defined by federal law, statutes, regulations, or interpretive precedent, and which couldn't be aired on broadcast television. Now, I want to stop here briefly just to point out that contrary to what you've heard this morning, Shakespeare doesn't fall in the banned list. Mark Twain won't be taken out of schools. The Bible can't be taken out of schools. Why is that? Let's look back to the definition. 
do those materials contain descriptions or depictions of sexual conduct as defined by state law? They don't. Let's start with the Bible. I've read it, all of it. And certainly it refers to acts of, as we've heard, sexual assault, but it doesn't describe them or depict them in anything close to the degree of detail that state law defines as obscenity. Does it refer to acts of sexual intercourse? It does, whether it's the King James Version referring to Adam knew his wife Eve, or more modern translations, Adam had relations with his wife Eve. Again, nowhere even close. This is not a close call, friends. Nowhere close to meeting the standard for obscenity. How about Mark Twain? Huckleberry Finn uses terminology that none of us would use today to refer to our friends and our, our, uh, our, our fellow citizens of color. We wouldn't use those words, but the book does. Does that mean that book could be removed from school? Let's look back at the definition. Does it include de depictions or descriptions of sexual conduct as defined by state law? I don't believe it does. It's been a few years since I've read Huck Finn, but I don't think it falls under that category. Next, uh, next piece of description, uh, the definition. Does it include words or depictions that would be considered obscene or indecent under federal law or interpretive precedent? Folks, I practice in this area of law. There's not a single precedent in the country saying that Huck Finn or uh, uh, Tom Sawyer, fill in the blank, whatever book it is that, that we've been told might be, might be removed from libraries. There's not a single court case in the country. There's not a single federal statute or regulation in the country under which those books could be considered obscene or indecent. What you've heard, respectfully, to my friends who have spoken already today, is an attempt to generate a straw man to scare you into thinking that what you might do here is take legit legitimate and uh, appropriate literature out of the libraries. That's not what's targeted by this regulation, and no one with a straight face could stand up in front of the court and argue that it is. I know my time is ticking. Let's move on from the definition. Section two, we're midway through page three, refers to the responsibility of school districts. I want to stop only briefly to emphasize the first paragraph. And this is relevant, incredibly relevant, and we'll come back to it again a little bit later in my talk to you, in regards to how the First Amendment relates to what we're doing here today. Bear with me. I'm an aspiring First Amendment law professor, and you're my class today. From a First Amendment standpoint, there is an incredibly significant distinction between private expression on the one hand and governmental speech on the other. Private expression. Cases that probably you're familiar with by description, if not by name. Private expression, student expression in the context of schools, is, is subject or protected by really rigorous First Amendment protections. Going back to the Vietnam War, famous case of Tinker versus Des Moines School District. Students wanted to show up wearing black armbands in protest of the war. The, the administration didn't like it. The case goes all the way to the US Supreme Court because that was students expressing their views, protected speech. That's one example. I could give you a dozen more. In contrast, governmental speech, that's not private expression. That's taxpayer-funded employees making taxpayer-funded decisions to purchase taxpayer-purchased materials to be used in a taxpayer-run program. That's not private expression. Now, do governmental employees have First Amendment rights? They do, but in their job functions, they are significantly limited. I won't take the time to explain to you the case Garcetti versus Sabalos, but government employees doing their government jobs, sitting at their government desk using government computers, don't have the same First Amendment rights as you and I do going about our business in our private capacities in our everyday life. I don't want to beat this horse too dead, but it's an important point, and I wanted to mention it to you there. Section three, you'll see at the bottom of page three, and it spills over onto the top of page four. The criteria for selection or review of new or existing instructional materials. Again, we don't have the time to walk through it in detail, but I do want to walk through it in at least enough of an overview fashion that we know what we're talking about. We can have a meaningful conversation together this morning. Subsection A, 
each district board, and let me pause. This isn't new, this isn't anything new that we're creating here. This is, this is reflecting what our reality that already exists. A district school board has authority over what happens in that district. We're articulating that here. The district's board is responsible for ensuring that the instructional materials, both the ones already in the school and the ones new coming in through the front door, are compliant with this regulation and with the law. Subsection B is where the rubber starts to meet the road. Upon the effective date of this regulation, a board can select new or incoming materials and may keep and continue using current existing instructional materials only if it passes at first two mandatory requirements, two mandatory threshold filters. The first, that it's age and developmentally appropriate as defined in this reg. We've already talked about that this morning. And second, B, the material is aligned with and supportive of the state standards. This shouldn't be a shocker. We're saying that materials can be used, purchased with taxpayer funding, placed in a taxpayer funded building, used in a governmental program, unless they're age and de developmentally appropriate, and that they actually support the educational mission of our public schools. Now, of the millions of books and resources in the world, a huge percentage of them will satisfy those criteria. There is no risk, as we've heard this morning, incorrectly, that by passing this reg, somehow we will have eliminated vast swaths of the instructional materials in the world that will no longer be eligible for use in our public school system. Of the millions of materials that are still eligible, that pass those two first mandatory threshold filters, then under subsection C, there are five additional prudential requirements. So I just want to draw the distinction between you've got two requirements that must be met. They are mandatory. Then of, again, the millions of materials that pass that test, we've got five elements here that could be considered for deciding of the limited shelf space we've got, of the limited hours of the day we've got, what do we want to spend our money and our time on? And this fits perfectly in with what we've already heard from some of the speakers earlier this morning. It allows for teachers to exercise their educational judgment from among the millions of appropriate books and materials. It allows administrators and librarians to do so, right? Things like, is the material academically or intellectually rigorous? Does it have educational significance? Is it valid? Is it accurate? Is it objective? Is it appropriate? The fact that we've only got so much shelf space in the library, we can't have every book in the world. The Library of Congress can, but we can't. So we've got to figure out what are the best ones to fit. And we've only got so many hours in the day, we can't teach kids every book. We've got to pick the ones that will do the best job of preparing them to be effective citizens upon graduation. Subsection D, this is halfway down page four, is an important point that I think, again, reflects what we've already heard this morning. There's one thing that we want to be very clear about. In fact, it's repeated no less than three times in this regulation. I'm going to read this to you because it's really important. Subsection D, in no event shall a school district board's decision to remove existing instructional material or to reject the proposed addition of new instructional materials be based primarily on or motivated by the district board's disagreement with or opposition to the viewpoints expressed therein. What a placeholder there in your mind. When we get to the end of the reg, walking through it, I'm going to talk to you some about the law, and we're going to come back to talk about that in particular. So I want you to make a, a, a mental note or even a, uh, you could put a lot, little asterisk by that in your copy. Here's all I'll say for now. That paragraph right there is not only reflective of controlling precedent, but it's reflective of what I and I know all of you believe. And that is, in the marketplace of appropriate ideas, right? We're leaving aside already the sexually explicit stuff that has no educational value. That's not age and developmentally appropriate. But within the marketplace of ideas, I think the good ideas will win. Now, what I think are the good ideas and what any of you think are the good ideas might be different, and that's okay. For example, let's say that in our libraries, our school library has a, a biography about President Jimmy Carter. Now, 
between you and me, I don't think he was that great of a president. But that's just my opinion. That doesn't mean that I think we should get rid of a book about Jimmy Carter. You may think he was a great president. That doesn't mean we should buy all the books about Jimmy Carter or put it on the other foot. Maybe you think that Ronald Reagan was a great president, and I think he wasn't, or vice versa. The point is we're not getting rid of books just because we don't like the ideas in them or we have political opposition to them. We're okay with there being a diversity of viewpoints and opinions. That's not what we're going after here, and it expressly says that. We do not need to fear that this regulation is going to somehow empower districts or this board to go on a sweep through the libraries, getting rid of ideas you don't like. You can't do it, and we don't need to be worried about that. Section four of the regulation, we're now at the bottom of page four, sets out the process for public participation in a district review of existing instructional materials. It's a lengthy section, and I'm certainly not gonna try to read it all to you, but again, I do wanna highlight a few things in it briefly. First, it'll bring uniformity to this process. There will be a form, a complaint form, promulgated by the Department of Education that a complainant, a person who wishes to complain about a piece of material, can use. Now, let me pause briefly. We've already heard this morning that one of the alleged flaws or shortcomings of this proposed regulation is that it allows anyone residing in a school district to file a complaint, rather than restricting that ability merely to parents of students in the district. I've got a couple of thoughts on that. First, it seems to me that it's appropriate to allow anyone residing in the district to file a complaint because that person's tax dollars are being used to purchase the materials. I'll point out briefly the irony that my friend Mr. Mulkin uh, finds this inappropriate Nevertheless, his employer, the ACLU, frequently, as is its legal right, relies on a doctrine known as taxpayer standing, which means that a person, even if not individually and personally affected by a governmental decision with which they disagree, may file a lawsuit in certain contexts because they're a taxpayer and it's their tax dollars at work. The same principle, I believe, should be true here. A person who resides in the district ought to be able to participate in the process. Let's keep moving on down through the subsections of section four. Subsection B sets a timeline. I believe it's a timeline that is both appropriately timely without being unrealistically swift. As we've already heard in the comments this morning, and as I'm sure you may have or could hear from other anecdotes around the state, at times this process of a book review or an instructional material review stretches on for months and months and months. And perhaps that's with good reason. Those of you who have been or currently are members of school district boards deserve our appreciation and thanks. It is, I know at times, in fact, perhaps most of the time, a thankless job, an unpaid volunteer commitment that takes up an enormous amount of time. And so there may be, again, legitimate reasons why sometimes these review processes take a long time. But they shouldn't. I think both the people in support of this particular regulation and those who oppose it would all agree that a swifter process, regardless of the outcome, would be better. And what we've tried to do here is set a time requirement of 60 days that we believe is both feasible but is also adequately expeditious. Subsection C, well, let, let, let me back up and, and, and highlight one other thing about subsection B. So we've got the 60-day requirement. We've also got the requirement of hearing at which people can attend and offer comments, both pro and con. One of the commenters earlier this morning mentioned principles of due process and fairness and transparency. Absolutely, absolutely. This will be a transparent process at which people can show up. And a little bit later on, we'll notice that a district board's decision under this process and in the event of an appeal, this board's decision under this process will have to be articulated and explained. Again, those are fairly fundamental, uh, fundamental components that we would expect from any other type of 
reviewing body, whether in an agency context or in the court system. Now, subsection C uh, refers to the fact that the district board can either remove the material if it believes appropriate, it can keep the material if it believes appropriate, or it can make the material retained but subject to parental permission. One of the comments we've heard this morning is that a regulation like this allegedly usurps local control. A couple of thoughts in response. It's not usurping anything. This board already has the authority. It has the statutory authority to do what is being done here. So this isn't some new, novel, creative uh, imposition of new authority. And secondly, what we're trying to do here is retain as much local discretion as is possible. Right, we've given multiple options for what a board could do, a district school board could do in this setting. Subsection D, if a complainant is aggrieved or disagrees with the decision made by a school district, they can appeal to the state board of education. It sets out the process there. And again, it, it is in large part reminiscent of what we've just talked about. Public hearing, notice and comment, comments pro and con, a public decision, a public articulation and explanation of the decision. Again, all indicia or components of what we would, in every context, consider to be a fair, transparent process. At the bottom of the page, subsection E, you'll see again, we've re-articulated. The district board's decision, just like a school board's decision, cannot be motivated primarily by its opposition to or disagreement with the ideas. We're not in the business of running ideas out of school because we think they're bad ideas. We are in the business of removing materials from school that are not age and developmentally appropriate and that aren't aligned with and supportive of the state standards. Bottom of page five, section five, spills over to the top of page six, district selection of new materials. It's a short section. When a district is considering bringing in new materials, whether that be textbooks, whether that be library books, whether that be any manner of other materials used in the public school, the new materials have to comply with these requirements just like the existing materials do. Once a new material comes in, it becomes existing material. And we've already talked about the process for reviewing existing materials. Section six, this is toward the top of page six, statewide effect of the State Board of Education's determination of the educational suitability of materials. In essence, this says that once a challenge to a particular material has worked its way up through this process to this board, and this board has made a decision, that decision will be applicable across the state. This is not something that should cause us to gasp in astonishment, throw our hands into the air, scream at the sky. This is the exact same process that we apply in nearly every context of government. Do we allow state trial court judges the final word on any matter? We don't. There's an appellate process. It doesn't just end with our state Supreme Court. It moves up to our United States Supreme Court, assuming it's jurisdictionally appropriate. The similar process that we've described here plays out in all kinds of contexts, both in the regulatory agency process, in the court system, and elsewhere. Section 7 nearing the bottom of page six, enforcement. You'll notice subsection A, for a first violation, the board can issue a written warning. A second violation, the board can hold a hearing and take actions that it deems appropriate and within its jurisdiction. The only point I'll make there, again, in response to a comment we've heard earlier, is that uh, this regulation should not and will not cause anyone any librarians, any teachers, any administrators, fear, anxiety. It's not the sort of Damocles hanging over their head with no one knowing when perhaps it could fall. It's quite clear what the standards are. And you'll notice too, subsection B at the bottom of the page, the state board hearing 
And the response, again, that we've heard is this um, onerous threat. You notice in the second line of that, it comes into play only when, again, we're talking about a repeat violation and when it was knowing, intentional, or willfully reckless. The goal here is not to go out and get anybody. This isn't a gotcha exercise. This isn't an exercise to make anybody be walking on eggshells. It is an exercise in setting clear definitions and clear standards and upholding them. Let's move on to page seven. We're nearing the end of the what portion of my comments. Preemption, three subsections. The first says that upon its effective date, this regulation would preempt any local policies to the extent they're inconsistent. Again, this is pretty plain vanilla bread and butter. Every state statute, I say every, I'll put a, a, an asterisk there. There are rare exceptions, but nearly every state statute preempts local ordinances that are inconsistent to it. In the same way, every federal statute preempts state law that's inconsistent with it. This is basic supremacy clause type stuff. Subsection two, merely to point out that this regulation and the requirements it imposes are in addition to or supplemental to other regulations, in particular, those that regard the purchase of textbooks. As I'm sure you all are familiar with, there's already statutory and regulatory requirements relating to how textbooks can be selected, approved, purchased, retained. We're not saying that those all go away. Those continue to exist. These continue to exist. They are supplemental to one another. They are in harmony with one another. And then finally, <coughs> third subsection there, and again, this is a little bit of a, a superfluous statement of the obvious. Again, in our, in our ordered structure of government, a regulation cannot displace a statute. Nevertheless, for avoidance of doubt, we've made clear here that this regulation doesn't and isn't intended to supersede, conflict with, or replace any of these state statutes that are listed here. All right, we're nearing the end, but we ain't there yet. You've still got to listen to me talk about case law. And this is where I'll have to restrain myself because I'd love to stand up here and talk to you all about this next part for an hour, and I know I've already probably used up some of my time. I want to talk just about four cases in particular and at a higher level than I wish we had time to do. Two of these cases are from the Supreme Court. One of them is from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the federal appellate court in the jurisdiction that South Carolina is located. And one from the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the federal appellate court that encompasses Florida and Georgia. Let's start with the U.S. Supreme Court. 1982, a great year for America. Not just because that's the year I was born, but because a lot of good things happened then. One of the things that happened in 1982 that could have given us more clarity but didn't was the only case in which the U.S. Supreme Court has ever considered a public school library book challenge. Island Trees Unified School District versus PICO. It's a set of facts. I won't go into it all here, but there were parents who complained about some books in the library, some of which were vulgar. Read the opinion, and uh, it'll raise your eyebrows. There are some excerpts from the book in there. It made its way all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and here's where it's a little bit less helpful than we might hope it is. Of the nine justices, they wrote seven separate opinions. None of them could agree on just about anything. No one opinion commanded a majority. There is no holding. As a side note, if anybody ever tries to quote PICO to you as if it were authoritative and determinative, put a little footnote next to that because there is no majority holding in PICO. The only thing that they could agree on was they weren't ready to decide the case yet. So they agreed to send it back down for further proceedings in the lower courts. Now, that said, we can at least read those seven opinions and get a sense of what those nine justices 40 years ago individually thought about this topic. Now, does that mean that any of the nine justices on the court today would think the same thing? They might, or they might not. At best, PICO gives us guidance. It tells us what nine justices 40 years ago thought about the issue. And here are two things that most of them agreed on. 
One, vulgar books can be excluded from a school library. And two, books can be excluded from a school instructional material list if they are not educationally suitable. Now, if those two points sound reminiscent to you, it's probably because we just talked about the two threshold filters in this regulation. Age and developmentally appropriate, as defined in this regulation, to exclude pervasively vulgar materials, and that materials must be supportive of and consistent with the state instructional program. So if we can discern anything from PICO, it sounds an awful lot like the regulation you have before you today. There's some additional guidance we can discern from PICO, though it's not a holding, because again, there was no majority opinion, that at least some of those justices would be suspicious of and would not be inclined to countenance a board's opposition to or political disagreement with the ideas or the viewpoints in a book. And perhaps again, you're thinking, that sounds familiar. Well, because three times in this regulation, it rearticulates that standard. Next, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer. Sometimes you'll hear people call this case Hazelwood. Sometimes they'll call it Kuhlmeyer. That's just to keep you on your toes and make sure you're paying attention. 1988, so this case postdates PICO. It involves a school-sponsored, student-run newspaper. Now, why is that relevant? Because this is actually, in my opinion, a little bit of a harder case, right? This isn't just government-bought books. This is a student-run newspaper where student authors and student editors had written stories about teen pregnancies. And the school administration had some concerns about it and pulled the stories. Why is that a harder case? Because it's kind of a hybrid of student expression and government-run speech, right? It was a student-run newspaper, but it's school-sponsored. Even in that harder case, the Supreme Court, in this case, did issue a holding that generally reinforced an administration's right to control, in that case, newspaper content for its suitability and appropriateness. So to the extent we can analogize to Kuhlmeyer or Hazelwood, again, supports the concept that a school board, a school district's board, or in this case, the state agency, can make determinations of educational suitability based on age appropriateness and alignment with the school's mission. Next, a Fourth Circuit case. This is our own, our own jurisdiction. 1996. So again, we're moving chronologically. We're getting closer to the present day. The case is known as Boring, not because it was uninteresting. That was literally the name of the party who brought the case. This case was brought, Boring, was brought by a high school drama teacher who had selected a particular dramatic production to use at the school. Administration didn't agree with some of the depictions and material in the case, told me he couldn't use it, filed a lawsuit. Now again, it's a little bit different from the others. In this case, we've got a teacher bringing the lawsuit, not a student, not a parent. Why do we bring this up? A couple of points. One, it establishes, at least in this district, and you can find cases, excuse me, from other circuits as well, that a teacher does not have a First Amendment right to select the materials they use. We've heard this morning about the idea of academic freedom. Doctrinally, principally, applicable at the higher education context, and perhaps even something that we could see as a prudential when appropriate concern. But as a legal matter, a teacher, a librarian, an administrator has no First Amendment right to select the materials used in the school. A second point that we can discern from the boring case uh, toward the end of the opinion, it refers to the fact that accuracy, objectivity, validity, and veracity of materials matter. Now remember, that case was about a play, a dramatic production. It wasn't about math. It wasn't about science. It wasn't about chemistry. It was about drama, literature. 
right? These aren't hard sciences. This was a soft discipline. And even so, the Fourth Circuit said, we can see that accuracy, objectivity, objectivity, validity, veracity, those things matter, and they are legitimate things for a school district to consider. Now again, perhaps you're thinking, some of those terms sound vaguely reminiscent. Look back early in the regulation, the five prudential concerns. You'll see them reflected there. Last case that I'll talk about this morning, ACLU versus Miami-Dade School District. This is the 11th Circuit case, arose obviously by the case name in Miami, um, in Florida. It's an interesting case. It's a lengthy opinion. Um, if you have interest and lots of free time, go and read it. You'll find it interesting, I think. But some parents objected to the inclusion in the school library about a particular book, and in fact, it was part of a series of books about life in Cuba. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, due to demographic reasons, that was a particular concern to the Miami area community, many of whom are of Cuban descent or are Cuban immigrants. They believed that this book presented an unrealistically flattering view of life in Cuba at that time. And they wanted it removed for its factual inaccuracies. The case is interesting on a number of grounds, uh, including the question of who had standing, who had the legal basis to bring that claim. But for our purposes, it's mostly interesting in its holding which is that school boards can remove library books if they determine that the books were educationally unsuitable due to factual inaccuracies in the book. Again, this regulation aligns with and is defensible under the cases we've discussed and others. That case, ACLU versus Miami-Dade, again reiterates, though, that we wouldn't want to be taking books out of school just because we don't like the viewpoints in them. So, for example, if it were a book about Cuba, they were factually accurate. It were objectively correct. But it took the position that communism was a superior form of government to capitalism. Is that a book that would be appropriate to discuss? Again, it's probably a bit, a bit much for elementary school students, but for high school students, certainly. And the fact that, I'll use myself as an example, that I think communism is not the better system, that's not a basis to get rid of it, just because we don't like the ideas in it. But the absence of factual accuracy, that's a basis to remove it. And again, that principle is reflected in this regulation. I'm not sure how long I've talked, and it's obviously the time goes faster for me when I'm the one talking than for y'all, the ones listening. But let me wrap it up at that point. I suspect that some of you may have questions. I'd be happy to do my best to try to answer them, if I can, at whatever length the chair thinks is appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. We appreciate you being here today. Are there any questions for our presenter? If so, I do remind you to please raise your hand and wait until you're called upon. And if you can direct the question to me, and then we will get a response back from Mr. Coleman. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Walters. Madam Chair, you know I've got questions. <laughs> um, and, and actually, if I may, my first question would be for Mr. Tyler. And, uh, and really, that's for the, the benefit, I think, for the folks out here. Right. The committee's vote this morning would be for the limited procedural purpose of putting this on the agenda for 1 o'clock today. So just for that limited purpose only. That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that the folks here with us this morning understand that. Um, Thank you, Mr. Walters. Yes, And then on. the uh, next one also would be for Mr. Tyler, too. If for some reason this did not pass first reading this afternoon, it could be brought back at a later date. That's correct. Okay. Just, again, just kind of laying some foundation for the folks here with us this morning. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can continue with yes, some please. other questions here. Uh, and I don't want to monopolize the time this morning, but I know everybody's going to have lots of questions this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, would a state board decision be appealable to the administrative law court or another court? I know in other types of hearings, we hold that they are. Thank you. So, yeah, great question. The answer to that question would be controlled by state law, and in particularly the Administrative Procedures Act, or the APA, uh, which I don't have a copy of it in front of me, but as I suspect you're familiar, generally provides that final decisions of agencies can be appealed to the APA. I don't want to offer a definitive legal opinion on the question, but I will say that the, that's the test that would be applied. 
is that um, you would look to see, does this meet the criteria or the definition of a final agency de uh, decision as defined in the APA? And if so, then it would be appealable to the ALJ. Nothing we can do or say in the regulation would change that because the statute is what the statute is. So it is, it is possible. Um, it'd be dependent on applying the APA to determine whether the particular decision in question constituted a final agency decision. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a law nerd. I, okay. I was a summary court judge for years. And so, I, I, I recognize my people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as the structure of what a, a state board hearing would look like, I mean, we have our rules of governance, uh, but th there's not a lot in here that really addresses that. Uh, for instance, it says a complainant can appeal to the state board. Would they need to list the grounds for their appeal, or can they just say, I appeal to the state board and sign their name to it? To the extent that we can analogize to our rules of civil procedure in the state court system, the appeal itself, just like a notice of appeal in state court, could be, in fact, quite brief. It, it could be a sentence. But like an appeal in our state court system, we would have a record of decision below. So that would be in front of this body in the case of an appeal, right? We would have the either orally verbalized and recorded explanation provided by the district board, or perhaps even better yet, a written requirement, both, either one of which is required by the regulation. So that we can see, and I say we, so that you can see, all of us, the public as well, can see what was the basis for the district's decision and how did they apply the requirements, the criteria. Um, uh, and and let, me, let me answer a bit more than you asked. So that would be sort of the notice of appeal. But you asked, too, about how the procedure would work. There are some basic but not incredibly detailed guidelines in the regulation itself. For example, it would be a public hearing. It would be subject to FOIA and the other open meeting requirements. It could be either conducted by a quorum of the full board or in the board's discretion, depending on timing, availability, and volume, it could be assigned in the first instance to a committee of the board, comprised of at least five members, who could hear the, the testimony, who could review the decision, who could then issue, again, borrowing from our rules of civil procedure, a report and recommendation that would then be reviewed and considered by the full board. That's, that would be a way of expediting and making more efficient the process so that all 17 people or whatever the number of quorum would be, probably 13 or something like that, whatever the number might be, don't have to all collectively sit through the meeting. And you're tracking where, where I'm going with this. Uh, as magistrates, uh, we had to fill out a paternal appeal when somebody appealed us, and it basically gave a, a short three or four page version of what the trial looked like, who the witnesses were, what the testimony was. And so that potentially sounds like that that's what a local board would have to do to send it to us? Or is that a rule we need to consider? Is it something we need to put in the regulation, I guess? Something along those lines, I think, will happen. So in the regulation, what it would require of the district board meeting is that it be, again, compliant with FOIA, open meeting requests, hear from both pro and con, uh, members of the public who want to participate and that they expressly articulate the basis for their decision. I don't know with legal certainty that all 80-ish districts in the state record their meetings. I do know that many, perhaps most of them do, and they're memorialized either on YouTube or, or they're privately recorded. So I think materials like that, generally speaking, would be available, and even if they're not, the fact that the, that the state board meeting would, again, hear testimony, uh, again, both pro <coughs> and pro the public participants, um, I think would give you a, an ample basis to establish and have in front of you what, what you would think of as a factual record upon which to make a meaningful and substantive review. And again, uh, and I apologize for bringing legal Latin terms into the discussion, um, but the state board's re review would be what in the law we would call de novo, Latin for anew. You're not bound by, you don't have to give deference to the district board's decision. 
Now, you, you might want to. You might think, well, they, they're thoughtful, intelligent people. We'll, we'll give some weight to that, but you're not required to. So the, whatever the record was before them could be helpful, but the record before you is what it is, and you're allowed to make a de novo decision. And, and along these same lines here, um, do we need to make a reference into regulation 59570 deals with hearing and hearing uh, officers for the state board? Uh, I think we talk about it in the regulation, but we don't have a reference to our legal authority to do that. And I didn't know if that's something we might need to stick in there somewhere. Uh, but I'm asking a lot of questions about procedure. I know procedures don't need to be in the regulation, but I think we need to have some reference in the regulation or somebody who wants to go and see what the procedures are, whether it's in our rules of governance or, uh, and I know this is probably a lot of inside baseball to everybody else in here right now. But uh, for instance, like we had to do this morning, since we're limited to 30 minutes of public input, uh, you know, potentially some of these folks could come in when we talk about interested parties, and I'll come back to that in a second. We could have a bus load on each side of an issue show up, and so we would need some sort of limitations on that. And so I'm just thinking about the structure of, of what a hearing would look like. I know certainly in, in our teacher cases, in the cases where we hear uh, fiscal watch appeals and stuff, uh, we do have some rules there. And I just might be more thinking out loud than an actual question at this point. But uh, I do think we need to consider that. But back I, to the, if I may continue, Madam yes, Chair, the, the in, interested parties, uh, I don't think we have a, a definition in the regulation as to what that is. Could you expound on that a little bit? Sure. Um, I'll try to hold that question in my mind. I want to mention two things, rewinding back just a second. I think you make a great point that, that we're not riding on a completely blank canvas in terms of procedure. This board already conducts hearings and there's precedent in that sense for, for how the procedure could work. Secondly, you've kind of put your, put your finger on an age-old legislative and regulatory dilemma, which is how do you balance offering, providing sufficient specificity while leaving sufficient flexibility? And that's, that's a bit of a tightrope. You can fall into either ditch on either side of that road. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is other than to say, I think this is a pretty pretty darn close to it. But I, I think you've certainly put your finger on, a, on an important point. Uh, the question you asked most recently, interested parties. So it's not included in the, the definition section. And you know, I, I don't know that in section four, discussing public participation, it limits interested parties to those residing in the district. It may be that this board in its, in its judgment thinks that is an appropriate restriction to make again so you don't have people coming in from out of district or out of state. Or, or, or it may not. I'll give you the pro and the con. The con, as you've already mentioned, is right. theoretically you could have you know, trucks, truckloads of people coming up from Georgia to come testify. Nothing against people from Georgia, but we don't really need them coming up here to tell us what we ought to have in our schools. They, they, can, they can deal with their own problems. Um, so you don't want that happening. On the other hand, by restricting it unduly narrowly, and again, regardless of, of viewpoint on the issue, you could, for example, and I, I, I don't know where Mr. Mulkin lives, but let's say, I'm, I'm going to guess he doesn't live in Chester, South Carolina. Let's say that Chester School Board is considering something, and maybe he wants to come talk, or maybe I want to come talk. Now, he and I probably agree on some things, and I know we disagree on some things. But he's a pretty smart guy with some experience, and I'm a pretty smart guy with some experience. And either of us, I think, could contribute to the board's analysis and discussion. But neither of us would be able to do that if we limited it to people in the district. Now, does that mean you should limit it or you shouldn't? That's for y'all to decide, not for me. Those are just some things to think through as you're thinking about it. Okay. And, and I'll save some of this stuff for later. Um, 
one thing, though, that uh, and, and some of these questions are not mine. It's questions people posed to me, and I thought they were worthwhile of, of discussion. So I don't want anybody to try to draw any conclusions about which way I'm leaning with this. But uh, I want to go back for a second here to Statute 1615.305, which is the disseminating state law. And then if we look on the regulation on the last page, I'm just thinking of page six, for a sep second or subsequent violation that uh, was knowing or intentional or willful, if you look at the statute, and again, let me flip back over to it. Uh, under paragraph A, it's unlawful for any person knowingly to disseminate. If it's a second offense, could they potentially be subject to criminal prosecution? In short, no, at least not as a result of this well, I regulation. Think, I, I think that's what the legislative intent is, not to do that. Um, but I just want to, I want to be real careful about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, th I think probably the the shortest answer to that, and I'm happy, I'm a lawyer, I'm always happy to talk more and give you the long answer, but the short and probably most helpful answer is legally a regulation cannot expand the scope of a statute beyond where that statute already goes. And in addition, by the terms of this statute, it doesn't purport to do that. Now, I, I hear and acknowledge your question. I think it's a legitimate one. But I think primarily for the first of those reasons, but also for the second, th the statute is what it is, and it does what it does. And with all due respect to this board, nothing that we do here this morning or elsewhere in a regulation can change that. Um, we're merely incorporating by reference a definition, which is, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen plenty of examples of this before, which is a pretty common thing to do in the law in other contexts. Um, but I do hear your question. I think it's a good one. And I, th I think it is important to be clear that this wouldn't expand criminal liability where it doesn't already exist. And I've talked with, with a couple of prosecutors, too, and, and pretty much gotten the same answer. They're going to look at legislative intent and the regulation versus statute type thing. I just think that's something that needs to be public as well. And. I think, Madam Chair, that's got through the list at least the first time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walters, for your questions. Does anyone have any other questions, Dr. Johnson? Madam Chair, I'm, I am a, a former principal, so I'm looking at this from a real practical sense, I'm afraid, in trying to implement and follow the guidelines that are here. And two things stand out to me that I think could be uh, abused in how it's written. One is the funding issue when someone says you're spending taxpayer money. Very often schools, most of our larger high schools have foundations that donations are given to the school for, you know, uh, at, at my work, I was given money to, to purchase library books. Does it then become district money when even though it is not taxpayer money, I, understand, I can see some things going through that process that, um, that would not have to adhere to the regulation because it wasn't purchased with taxpayer money. And the other piece that I, I see too cloudy on a, on a practical are the criteria. Age appropriate is not the same for everybody. We all don't see that as the same. Um, and we, we have a relatively vague definition here. And, and I'm not suggesting that it needs to be more specific, but I think we need to acknowledge if, if what this is all about is trying to make all schools, all districts handle it in the same way, that part, it won't be. And, I, you know, you mentioned based on the community where you live, it may be that th this particular book or this particular topic would be appropriate and another it might not be. That, to me, is also how the age appropriateness or is it academically necessary? I, I just feel like that could be abused in some way. Now, do we want to 
specifically say what that means. I don't think so, but I think we need to acknowledge that in this regulation. So great, great questions and comments. Let me start by saying thank you for your service as a principal. My wife's a public school teacher and she's working on her EDD in administration right now. And so I know it's an awful lot of work and an awful lot of sacrifice and, uh, and, and, and I want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. A couple of good points there. Um, it's going to depend on my memory to, to remember what, what you asked and what I was going to say. The, yep, the so, funding issue, yep. if we are saying it cannot be purchased with taxpayer money, and if it's not taxpayer money, can it then be purchased? Sure. So a couple of thoughts there. Okay. One, does the fact that a book was donated, or I mean, she, we all know teachers who are spending their own money right. to buy stuff. Right. I know it. I see it coming out of my checking account. <laughs> So we know that's happening. We know people are donating books. There are foundations giving books. I guess sub-question one there is, does that negate the argument that it's government speech or that the state board should control it? No. No. And here's why. Okay. Because once that book comes on site, who owns it? Yeah. The school district right. does. Right. Even, if it, even if it is allegedly owned by a teacher, where is that book sitting? In what capacity are students getting access to it? School. It's sitting on school property in a school building, secured by school funds. <coughs> you, you get the point. So it's, that's still government speech, even if it was donated. Second point there is related to the first, which is even a book that isn't initially purchased out of the, the school general budget is still subject to this. That's, that's built in. I, I could point you to the language. I won't do it right now. Um, that's built into the, into the reg for that reason. Because it doesn't matter how the book got in the door. Once it's sitting on school grounds and being provided to students on school grounds during the school day, that's school. To follow the same uh, guidelines. Now, to, to be clear, and obviously we aren't advocating for this, but if there's a teacher who on his or her own time, at their own place, with their own money, wants to buy other books that stay at their house, and they, they, they can do whatever they want with that there, at least according to this reg, that's, that's their time, their money, their place. But if you're on property, on the clock, at the school, in the context. And, and, and again, we, we apply these kinds of rules all the time in other contexts, right? If you're a, pick a religion, if you're a devout Jewish public school teacher, are you allowed to participate in synagogue on Saturday? Absolutely. Are you allowed to teach children at synagogue, even if they're some of your students? Absolutely. Are you allowed to keep religious materials in your home and use them to proselytize? Absolutely. But can you be doing that during the school day in your classroom? Probably not. Again, the, 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 these are not principles that I'm just making up. They're, they're, they're ones that, we, that we're familiar with. Um, oh, I'm getting too old for all this. What was your second question? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, just the criteria. Oh, that yeah. It's not very specific in terms of how it's written here, but it's almost as if we would need to be specific in order to follow that guy. It, it, it's the same question that Mr. Walters had. It's, it's, it's sort of the impossible dilemma. I, right. How can you be specific enough while still leaving room for application? Yeah. Yeah. You almost can't. Um, and, and, and again, what, what this reg tries to do is kind of how, how it's tried to be done in other contexts, which is you try to get as much clarity and specificity in the words on the page as you can, but you have to recognize that at some point, it's gonna be case by case application of the law to the facts. Our state and federal judges do this literally every day. 